Welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Corsantes. I am program director for the International Law Student Association here in Washington, DC. Thank you for joining us today. This panel is meant to solve some of the doubts that usually arise for most students before and during an, an oral intervention at the competition. Each of our panelists will first share some advice and then we will begin answering the questions. Many of you have already submitted your questions, so thank you for that. If you would like to ask something during the panel, you may do so on the function at the bottom of your screen, either on Facebook or YouTube, and we will address them at the end. Joining us today are Agnese Pizzola and Joe, Joe Fuchs. Unfortunately, Alyssa Glass could not join us due to an un, unforeseen circumstance. Now, our panelists are very experienced and committed friends of the Jessup who have participated in and judged the competition. So uh, I will leave you first with Agnesi uh, so she can introduce herself. Hi. Hello, hi, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, my name is Agnese Pizzolla. I am Italian, but I'm based in Germany, where I work as a legal counsel for the European Central Bank. Um, I have been involved with the JASEP for many, many years now. I started as a competitor uh, back in 2007. I coached my university teams for a few years. And then in 2010, I started judging. I judged ever since at international rounds, various national rounds. And since 2014, I'm also the national administrator for the Italian national rounds, which means that I had the opportunity in this time to look at the competition from various perspectives. So I hope that uh, um, this chat today is going to be helpful for you to prepare for the competition. I don't know whether um, I should stop here and let Joe introduce himself or whether I should go ahead. <laughs> um, sure, we can let Joe introduce himself. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Just a little bit of back and forth. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Joe Fuchs. Uh, I'm from Germany. Um, and while my real life uh, as an actual judge has not that much to do with international law any longer, my um, relationship with the Jessup also goes back a couple of years now. Um, I've coached several teams in Germany. Um, had two of them actually advancing to the international rounds in Washington. And uh, then I started judging. Um, and so far I've been to Brazil and Germany and Italy uh, and at the international rounds. So um, over the years, I would say I've picked up some of the things that I'm looking for, that my colleagues are looking for, and some advice that usually I tend to give teams well, after the round is already done uh, for their future rounds. So I'm quite happy to have the opportunity to uh, share uh, these pieces of information, of advice uh, today with all of you. And uh, maybe there's something uh, that you might uh, uh, apply to your own pleadings. So thank you very much, Stephanie, for giving us the opportunity. Well, not at all. Thank you for joining us. Um, so now if you would like Agnesi to start your, um, some advice maybe. Yeah, sure. So uh, talking with Joe, we kind of agreed that we are going to split our time uh, in a way that I will talk a little bit about how to prepare for the round. So what happens before you get into the courtroom, how to prepare your materials, your, um, let's say, the more technical part of the round, but uh, also how to manage stress. I mean, hopefully, uh, I can give you a little bit of tips uh, on how I learned to manage stress uh, uh, as a competitor and then in my professional life. So, um, And then Joe later will discuss uh, a little bit more about what happens during the round itself and how to interact with the judges. So. I would start with some very basic information on how to prepare for the competition in general. And the first thing that I wanted to mention is, might seems very 
obvious, but the first thing that you have to do to prepare for the Jessup competition is to study a lot. Um, the Jessup competition is very challenging. Um, your opposing teams are going to be extremely well prepared. Judges expect a very high level of knowledge of the law and uh, advocacy skills from you. So you need to be prepared. Jessup is not something that you enter into lightly. I'm sure that by now you saw it yourself because you had to prepare memorials. Maybe you already had your national rounds and you're getting ready for Washington DC, but that's really like the starting point. You need to prepare, you need to study, and you need to be confident um, with your knowledge, the knowledge of the case, the knowledge of the law. From a more technical and practical point of view, it's extremely important that you prepare your materials. Uh, as you might have seen, it's very common for competitors to head to the podium with like a folder or, or a binder or something where you keep all the documents that you think you may need, all the references, the case law, the case itself. Um, that materials needs to be organized. Um, not only because if your materials are not organized, you will look sloppy when you head to, to the podium, but also because having your materials organized will help you keep your mind organized as well and will allow you to be familiar with the documents that you have at hand. So you will know that if you need something, if you need to look into a specific quote of a case, um, you know exactly where in your binder this document is and you can easily retrieve it. If you approach the podium without materials or without having these documents organized, but just piled up, the result is that you will waste a lot of time looking for what you're um, searching for. Wasting time and again, giving the impression that you're being sloppy. So this is extremely important to have all your documents prepared before the competition. The other thing is you need to have as many practice rounds as possible. Um, not only with your teammates and your team advisors. The problem in, in, with practicing with your teammates as t and team advisors is that they will approach the case in the same way you do because they studied with you, they prepare with you, they follow the same reasoning. So after a while, you will notice that you will tend to end up in addressing more or less always the same questions. So it's very important that you expand the range of people in front of which you plead. Uh, of course, there are rules prohibiting uh, teams to face other teams when they're still competing. So I do not advise you to do so, but you can reach out to faculty advisors, for example, other faculty members who have not been involved with the preparation of the team, uh, but who may be willing to serve as judges for a practice round. Um, sometimes uh, teams contact lawyers uh, in, who practice various fields of law in their jurisdiction, and that helps a bit giving also a different perspective of the case. So many more as many you should have as many practice rounds as possible with different kind of judges because each kind of judges, so the academic, the professionals, uh, the students will help you addressing different questions from your case. The last one is about how to present. And my suggestion is when you're alone, rehearse in front of a mirror, and even if it's terrible, record yourself pleading and watch your recording. It's going to be traumatic. <laughs> you're going to hate it because you're going to hate how you speak. You're going to hate how you move. Um, and everyone does. So everyone hates looking at its own uh, um, recordings, but what you will see in that video is exactly what the judges will see. And this will help you twisting and adjusting your presentation, your style in a way that will improve your overall, your overall presentation. So include in your preparation also this sort of activity. 
then we skip in time, we get to the competition. Um, and well, few tips on how to address the day of the competition. Well, first of all, arrive well in advance to your scheduled round. Um, not only if you're staying in a different hotel, different venue, but even if you're going to be in the same hotel or in the same venue where the competition is held. I have in mind how the hotel is organized in Washington, DC. Uh, if you or your coaches have been there in the past, will know that taking the elevators can take lots of time especially in between rounds, um, because there are going to be dozens of teams trying to reach courtrooms, plus all the normal hosts of the hotels trying to reach their rooms. So even if you are in the building, you may waste a lot of time trying to reach the actual courtroom. So don't underestimate the time that may need that you may need to actually get to the courtroom. Um, ideally, you should be in front of the courtroom at least 20 minutes before the, the, your scheduled round, because then the bailiffs will come and take your data and all the, let's say, the more practical things, the preparation for the round. Um, but again, try to move towards your assigned room at least half an hour before. Uh, because what you don't want is that you will have to rush and you know be worried about not being on time and things like that. The other side of the coin is that personally, I do not advise teams to go too much in advance. Um, because you will, unless you have the very first round in the day, you will have to wait. And you don't want to spend 45 minutes standing in the corridor outside the courtrooms before, while the other teams finish their own pleading. So roughly half an hour, 20 minutes, I would say it's, it's the perfect timing. Um, once you manage to get into the room, check your assigned space. So check your table, make sure that you have the space that you need and prepare what you need for the round. That means preparing the documents, put them out on the table, on display as you're used to. Um, even more silly things like put water in your glasses so that you don't have to do it during the round. Everything that can then minimize, help minimizing disruption when the actual round starts. Try the podium, that is extremely important um, because every podium is different or at least it can be slightly different. So some of them will have a little shelf, some won't, uh, some are a bit larger, some are a bit narrower. So make sure that, for example, um, you try the podium, you know that uh, your folder fits well, that um, it's not too high, too low for you. Just get acquainted with the podium. Make sure that your um, materials are all there. So for example, many competitors like to bring a glass of water to the podium, but not all of them have a shelf where to put the glass of water. And we see often that you, like we see these competitors standing up from the desk with a glass of water, getting to the podium and then realize that there is no space where to leave the glass. And they, this is kind of, you know, they're looking around and then this glass ends up either back on the table or some, sometimes on the floor. So everything that can avoid this sort of disruption, just make sure that you take care of it in advance. Look at where the bailiff is. Make sure that you can see the bailiffs well. If the bailiff at that point in time is not in the room, ask a teammate just to sit on the chair of the bailiff for a second so that you may sure that you can see the bailiff um, and check if there are external noises or things that you can minimize. Um, unfortunately, there are going to be instances in which it's not going to be possible. So for example, uh, having in mind the international rounds, there are going to be some rooms in which there is going to be a very loud air conditioning. So unfortunately, this is part of the game. Um, so because it's either air conditioning on very loud or 
very hot, unbearable room. Um, but just the fact that you are aware that there is this noise it will help you prepare because you know, okay, it's very noisy. I will need to speak out louder because otherwise the judges will not hear me. So all these little things will help you get acquainted with the room. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention uh, before heading to uh, leaving the floor to Joe is the fact that despite all this preparation, you may still be extremely nervous and stressed before the competition, before you run, and this is absolutely normal. There are going to be people who are by nature very self-confident, who will not uh, have any problem in you know, standing up and uh, talking to the judges, but most of the people will experience a certain degree of stress. Um, there are many ways of trying to cope with this. Um, I have to say, uh, of course, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not trained to do to give any advice on, on stress management. But as a very stressed competitor myself, um, I managed to understand a little bit what works for me and what doesn't over time. And for me, the things that worked best was actually to rationalize and to understand why I was nervous um, and what was going on, why I was reacting in a certain way. And maybe you are familiar already with the concept of flight or fright response, uh, which is actually uh, explains why um, human beings get nervous and stressed and anxious. And basically it's linked to our survival instinct. You know, back in the time of the cavemen, um, we had to respond to threats. And those threats were physical threats, were, you know, dangerous animals, things like that. And so our body learned to respond to those threats with certain physical response. So, you know, increasing blood pressure, heartbeat, so that we had the power and the strength either to fight our danger or to run away. And unfortunately, what happens today is that our body still reacts that way, even if the danger is no longer physical, but it's emotional. So when you face a situation when you're not at ease and you are, have perceived you are perceiving a situation of danger, you will notice that the typical stress signals are exactly the same. Your heartbeat will go fast. You will start you know, blushing because your blood is going to run faster, but you don't have to run. You only have to bleed, and this can be a bit disruptive. So for me, understanding that this is the reason why we physically, we have this very physical reaction to stress was extremely important. And after that, well, everyone has to find its own way of reacting to it. There are many coping techniques. Um, for example, some people find sort of breathing meditation very helpful. It doesn't work for me, but for others do. Um, other people find um, being already physically tired extremely helpful. So going to the gym, going for, for a run, release endorphins um, could be an option. Um, some people give themselves confidence talk. So, you know, talking in front of a mirror, like to yourself, and uh, for some people it works. Um, other people uh, listen to a happy song or an empowering song. Um, some others tend to live or pre-live the experience in their mind so that you kind of get ready for what is coming. So you can even just Google like coping techniques for stressful situations um, and try them, try them and see what works better for you. Um, the important thing is that you remember that it's going to be absolutely normal to be worried and stressed on that day. So it's not a big deal. 
uh, your uh, success in the Jessup or in your future professional life will not depend on that. So um, please just relax and try to um, try one, one or more of these techniques and see what works best. So uh, I think I already uh, spoke to, for too long. Uh, I'll leave the floor to Joe for the rest. And then of course, I will be more than happy to go through the questions that we already received and um, address any additional questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Um, I will try to pick up uh, on where uh, Agnesa finished, sort of the moment of your um, of your pleading, um, with the um, with the idea that obviously preparing your pleadings contents and also the style and demeanor obviously are things that probably will be happening. The uh, the uh, next upcoming weeks. Um, and yes, uh, starting with the uh, preparation of your of the presentation of your argument, and yes, al already mentioned um, that you should prepare your documents. Um, just a brief input on that. Um, I know there are many teams that uh, just get to the podium with maybe one or two pieces of paper. Others bring an entire folder. And then there's uh, even even others who come to the podium with nothing at all. Um, in the in this context, as with many other issues, I wouldn't necessarily say there is just one way of doing it. Um, this is mostly the light motif of uh, of my input. Uh, I can give you some pieces of advice and I can give you some of the potential upsides and downsides of, of following up on it. But ultimately, it will be strategic choices that you guys will make on whether you will um, use these uh, use of these thoughts of mine or rather discard them. Um, as for the materials issue, um, for some people it can be distracting to have paper around. Um, others also like the sort of power play move of uh, appearing at the podium without any materials at all. Um, I would say that yes, this can impress some judges. Uh, but in terms of uh, potential downsides, there will be many, many judges, especially in Washington, D.C., who will feel triggered to ask you questions that you cannot answer, give you exact quotations of the problem, exact quotations of an ICJ case that you referred, ask you to read out a certain commentary uh, by the International Law Commission, and so on and so forth. So in terms of to see how far they can push you with that, uh, if you show up without nothing uh, at your hands, you might trigger these kinds of questions. So just be very aware um, of that. And the problematic issue there is that you might end up with questions that are um, not necessarily those that give you many points, uh, because those are like the easy back and forth agent, what is this? And then you read it out, you answer it question. It's not on this level of, okay, agent, what is your argument about? What is this case about? Let's really dive deep uh, into the um, discussion. So my piece of advice would be to avoid these questions. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, have to bring a massive folder or many things. I would say at least have the problem with you. That's the one thing that should be at hand. And then maybe some authorities that you might uh, find important and where you think there might be a certain likelihood that uh, judges will ask you very specific questions about them. And you don't have to open them all the time um, and, uh, and leave through them. You can just leave it there, but the mere fact that you have it there shows the judges that you're ready. Um, when it comes to the actual content, uh, I would advise you to be very conscious of potential questions in DC. Um, 
the qualifying rounds, uh, the national rounds can already be very intense. In DC rounds, it can happen that judges will keep you uh, at the very first argument of your very first claim for, let's say, 15 minutes. Um, and that means that while your, uh, your written submissions were very broad, very comprehensive, for your preparation for an oral round, I would advise you to focus on, let's say, maybe two core arguments um, on the uh, on the actual claim, and uh, discard this idea that you have to present everything, um, because ultimately, it's the judges who depend on you on your guidance and when you introduce your claim stating that for the purposes of this pleading while there is there are certain arguments to be made you will focus on this and that point and then the judges might get the hint that yes you could also discuss other issues but you will focus on these two if they don't like it they can ask you to 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 change your argument um, but I would say that it's quite likely that they will follow along with the roadmap that you suggested. And that gives you the opportunity to really develop arguments because again, in written submissions, you have the word count and you don't always have the option to really expand on your thoughts. Um, and if you do this sort of matter of fact style that memorials tend to have in a pleading, you trigger questions, but not exactly the questions that you uh, that you want to trigger. Just to give you an example, if an oralist states that or submits that a certain uh, rule uh, is part of customary international law and stops there, the judges will ask, "What's your authority for that?" Kind of like the back and forth answer thing. So to avoid that, the agent could introduce this as stating, "It's an." rule of customer international law as stated by this court in the case of the golden apple again if the agent stops there the uh the judges will then ask well agent what's that case about so next level you could say well this is a rule of customer international law as has been uh, held by this court in the case of the golden apple where in a dispute about this and that the court stated and then you could give a quote. And then the questions get more interesting because then the, the, the question that is to be triggered would be, um, so agent, how is this relevant to the present case? And even there, depending on how you prepend, prepare your submission, you can sort of um, uh, foresee this question and incorporate it in your pleading. And in the actual situation, this will mean that either the judges will listen to you all the time and then maybe ask you a question which is on the on the, sort of on the highest level of um, is this the right way of handling things? Do we maybe have another precedent to really go uh, onto the the uh, uh, sort of behind the scenes uh, uh, and an and overview perspective on the case? Or they will just interrupt you and cut you off and ask you one of the questions and since you already prepared these parts, you can rather seamlessly answer the question, while at the same time, it's actually the submission that you prepared um, that you are presenting so to them. And what this enables you to do is something that um, uh, also refers to the demeanor and style, where I would say there is not the one way of arguing Jessup. There is not one way of presenting an argument. Uh, if you watch uh, one of the many videos uh, that are uh, online of the final rounds, you will see that there are many different styles, often reflecting different mooting cultures in different countries. Um, what they have in common, though, is that the agents are seamlessly changing between their pleadings and their way of answering questions. And there is a couple of tricks that enable you to do that. And the first one would be to be rather conversational in your style. So 
not uh, adopt a very um, politician-like, booming, uh, um, uh, dramatic voice that you cannot uh, maintain when answering questions. And the other trick would be to really slow down your pleading. Because if your pleading is already rather slowly paced, judges will not notice if you have to think about answering their questions. Because if it's a new question, you might not be as fluent in your answer as you are when it's something that you have already rehearsed. So to give the judges the impression that you are just as confident, just as knowledgeable in answering their questions as with the part that you prepared for yourself, um, I think this can be a very good benefit. And that for that, it's very important to have a demeanor that overall fits your personality, maybe a bit more passionate, maybe a bit more laid back, maybe rather calm and serious. Um, there's a large variety, but try one that fits you well and that you don't have to spend too much energy on um, when it comes to maintaining this sort of um, agent personality that you will have to um, adopt. Um, try to maintain uh, or keep the grasp on your pleading. Um, as I said before, the bench needs your guidance. If you always give roadmaps and are very conscious of where you are in your pleading, um, that can be very helpful. Um, and uh, sometimes judges might be confused if we are in Washington DC and a, a judge has heard maybe four rounds already during that day, um, uh, they might get lost sometimes. Please do not hold it against them. Um, Sometimes judges might just act confused. Uh, so bearing this in mind, um, it's always up to you to, to show the judges very politely where you are in your agenda and what it is you want to do next. And politeness is the only thing where I would say this is mandatory. And being polite does not mean that you have to start every answer with thank you or even say, thank you, that was a very good question, a very interesting question. Yes, chances are you sound polite, but the potential downside is that you might sound condescending or the judges might think that you are stalling uh, or the judge will think, yeah, of course it's a brilliant question because I ask it, I only ask brilliant questions. I don't need that confirmation. So my advice would be, Thank you, rather something uh, for the very end of your submission. Um, but take your time, listen to the judges, never interrupt them. Even if you feel like they're going on and on and on, never interrupt the judge, think about the question and then answer. And uh, if you do that, maintain eye contact. Um, that is the best impression that you can give. Um, and I would say I stop here. We have a couple of uh, open questions. We are, uh, still have uh, some time left. Um, and uh, I, I'd say the two of us are uh, very excited to, uh, to give you more uh, insights. Yes, thank you. Um, let's see. Our first question, um, since we did cover a lot. Um, let's start with when arguing, is it important to know when you have convinced a judge? When is it wise to do that, to, to just keep going or, or actually say, I see that my argument is not convincing, so I will move on to my next. Personally, I would say at the same time, it does not matter at all. And it matters a lot whether you can convince the judges. The problem is that not all the judges will give you feedback on whether you, they are convinced by your argument or not. Um, or not necessarily your argument, but the, the, just the strategy. 
Um, it can happen that oralists present arguments that from a, let's say, doctrinal perspective, I consider not ideal, but that are very convincingly done. And maybe they are in a position where they have to argue this. So I'm very fine with that. Um, try not to wait for judges to confirm uh, your, um, your point. Um, and I would say that you should always try to prepare and train right now in how to answer a question and then seamlessly go back or go on, go further with your pleading. If the judges are not convinced, they will take you back. If they are convinced, they will let you go. Um, and sometimes they will have a follow-up question, maybe because they're very interested. Uh, in said argument, but if you feel like I'm getting cornered and the questions on the very same issue are piling up, I would say that yes, getting out is the better option because you're losing time without gaining any points. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say I see this argument is not convincing. You could either state that in the alternative, applicant would also submit uh, or briefly state that this is applicant's view um, and uh, now uh, agent for the applicant would like to proceed with the second submission and you just move on and you're out of it. I would just add one little thing on that, which is especially at the international rounds, judges will put a lot of emphasis and will consider very important for teams to be able to concede. Um, at the same time, especially when you bring an argument, conceding should not be your first option. So you present an argument, you start receiving questions from the judges, you are not sure whether they're liking your argument or not. I think for the first minute or two, you should still try to defend it to the extent possible, especially if it's something that you presented, and only then concede. Because otherwise, the judges will think, like, why did you bring this argument if then the first question you receive, you will be like, oh, yes, but I also have another argument. Sorry, I will concede on that. So either you don't bring an argument at all, or you are you have to be ready to defend it at least a little bit. And then when you see that that is going nowhere, you move to the next argument. And this is if I might, I might add on that, this is the high art of mooting, knowing when to concede, when not to concede, knowing when to keep on fighting your point and noting when to uh, uh, re yeah, uh, uh, sort of uh, abort the mission that you're on with your current argument. Um, it is not always easy. Many of it are very small choices within nanoseconds. Um, try to address the question as good as you can and then uh, go on with your pleading and beforehand that's also something that you can can very can be done very easily think about do i have to make this point or can i just concede it and focus on a stronger argument that i have in the back as and yes just introduced Yeah, um, so our next question is, what is the proper way to answer a question when you don't know the answer? Okay, this is a tricky one. And I think that as for many things in JustSub, there is not an answer that will make all judges happy. Different judges look for different things. Um, some judges will try you in order to see whether you can reason. So even if you don't know an answer straight straight away, maybe judges will give you some hints, they will give you some you know indication, and then they will expect you to reason. So m the first advice that I would give is use the elements that you have at your disposal to to try to get to something that makes sense for you on the basis of the information that you have. At the same time, many other judges, and I'm probably uh, I would put myself in that category, 
deeply hate when competitors try to say things that make zero sense just because they hope that judges will not understand that they are just making an argument up. Uh, that is terrible. So if you really have nothing to say, it's much better in my personal view to say, I'm sorry, I cannot assist the bench on this issue and move on. Because otherwise you risk that you will like trigger many more questions that you cannot answer because you will say something wrong and all judges will jump on it and start asking you more questions, um, more questions that you cannot answer. So this is just going to waste five minutes of your time. And then in the end, the judges are going to be like, okay, he, does, he or she doesn't know that. So let's move on. Um, so in the interest of bringing to the attention of the judges as many good points as possible, if you really don't know the answer and you really have nothing to say about a certain topic, just concede that you don't know it and move forward. Of course, it, it won't look ex exceptionally well, um, but it's still better than wasting five minutes of your time not answering questions. All right. And um, the next question is, what is the best way an analyst can approach a hot bench? You know, those those judges that just won't let you even speak sometimes because <laughs> they're asking so many questions. I think we've hinted at the main way of dealing with those. Um, keep your calm. Um, try to keep your structure have your structure in mind uh and if they ask too many questions if, if you feel cornered move on to the next issue um if you are um bombarded by questions try to sort them in your mind and just make sure that you show the bench that you um that you really try to address all of their questions um in a way every bench at the international rounds can turn into a so-called hot bench it will very often depend on what kinds of questions you trigger and um uh what uh what what questions you provoke it, it might sound a bit mean that I will that I'm putting all the all the blame on the oralists, but ultimately we can only ask you questions on arguments that you make. And even if judges ask you to go in a certain direction and you say, apologies, I cannot assist you with this issue, what are the judges to do? We can't stop the round. So uh, so technically, even with the hottest of the hot benches you are in charge and if you keep calm stay friendly and try to stay as focused and organized as possible while maintaining the precision that is required in legal argument i think you should be uh, you should be able to get through the pleading a very stressful situation but feeling feeling good about it yeah and um I feel like in my very few years of judging, um, I'll, I see a lot of oralists struggling with this, uh, with the responsiveness of the role of respondent. So can you guys, can someone explain to me a little bit, how well, how does it work? What's, what's the respondent supposed to do? Well, the easy answer is that the respondent has to respond. <laughs> so, um, the respondent is in the unfortunate situation of having little control on what is going on in the round. The applicant has the advantage that the applicant will choose which arguments to present to the court. When you're a respondent, you don't have that liberty. A good respondent is the one that listens to the arguments raised by the applicant and is able to adjust the presentation in order to address those issues. There is nothing worse than a, that a respondent that starts addressing issues that we didn't really discuss with the applicant 
or start contesting positions that the applicant never defended. Uh, a good respondent should adjust not only the topics, but also the order in which the topics are presented. So always mirroring what the applicant did. So if you have, I don't know, A, B, C, D issues, but applicant presented them in order C, D, A, B, you as a respondent will give a much better performance, which is going to be much more appreciated by the judges if you just trash your prepared speech and follow the order that has been prepared by the applicant. Of course, always within the order of questions that you prepare. So if you are, let's say, respondent, the first respondent who prepare question number one and question number two, no one will expect you to all of a sudden start presenting question two and three just be, or one and four just because the applicant did so. So um, always within your uh, prepared questions, your prepared points, um, try to mirror what the applicant did. Um, the applicant can, in a way, take into account what the respondent prepared in the memorials and could try to a certain extent to anticipate some of the arguments um, that the respondent may present, uh, either by referring to the memorial. So like um, we see that the respondent with respect to issue X, Y, Z uh, at page blah, blah, blah of their memorial stated that um, it's the position of the applicant that this is not the case because. Um, so this also signal the, let's say, capacity of a team to adjust to the other team submissions. But while this is optional for the applicant, this must be a given for a good respondent. Uh, you will hear it over and over as a feedback from the judges, respondent has to respond. And if you do, don't do that, you're going to be penalized in terms of how your presentation is going to be appreciated by the judges. And I'd say the one sentence we are looking for as judges from a respondent oralist is after introducing the claim that they are about to deal with, stating, now applicant has raised three arguments, respondent will address these issues in turn. And there you go. And then the judges no, we got the signal that you listened and that you adapted your pleading and you can take it from there. And that's just a very small thing that if you actually follow up on this can make a very good impression. And since we're in the topic of roles, um, what is the role of the off council? What does he or she do? Okay, I'll maybe I'll, I'll go first and then so I think that the role of the off council is often one of the most underrated role in the competition. While it can be key to the success of a team, uh, a good off council can make a team win around. Um, the role of the off council is, first of all, this person needs to be absolutely familiar with all the materials that you have at hand. Um, so if the judges ask for quotes, if you want to look up something, the off council is the one who is in charge and, and has control of all your materials so that can hand over the exact quote from uh, a specific ICJ case or commentary or whatever you need. Um, the off council is also the person who must listen to the judges the most. Uh, oralists are going to be extremely stressed and busy because they have to stand up, they have to, uh, you know, plead, they have to, you know, they have this emotional part of dealing with the judges in person and discussing with the judges. The off council doesn't have that because the off council is sitting on, at the table in a more, I would say, relaxed way compared to the other two um, competitors. So the off council must listen to the judges, must listen to the other team, must write down everything that it's key 
for the round, which can be mistakes of the other team. So that then when you stand up to the podium, either as a respondent or in the rebuttal, you can pinpoint at the exact mistake that the other team made. Uh, the off counsel must write down the important points raised by the judges. Most of the time, the questions that the judges ask to the other team are your strong points. So listen to what the judges are asking because that will show where the weakness of the other team is. Um, and then also many teams let the off council prepare the rebuttal and sub rebuttal, for example, uh, that it's up to you and every team is organized in a different way. Uh, but uh, many do because again, you are in this, um, position of having controls of the materials, listening to what's going on, and you can be more objective and focus on what can work or not. And so a good off council that supports the other two team members by providing quotes, providing elements to add to their speech and so on, can really uh, turn around in your favor. And since the role of the off council is so important, um, for the or for the first uh, oralist who does the introduction of the team, judges do appreciate it a lot if that person, even though they are not arguing, but because mo most FOJs will know that they have a vital role, that this person is introduced and um, yeah gets their moment to shine. So you should always introduce the off council to the bench. And the next question is, should we keep track of time or rely on the bailiff? Well, the bailiff is going to be there to signal the time and that's his job. So you can rely on the bailiff and the bailiff, the time as signaled by the bailiff, it's the only thing that counts in the courtroom. By the official rules, you are allowed to keep a stopwatch. Some teams do that. Um, and bring like this little stopwatch on the podium um, so that they can keep track of the time as it goes. Um, it's allowed, it's not compulsory. Uh, some teams find it helpful so that they always, know, the oralist always knows where, um, at which point of the speech they are. Uh, some others will find it distracting because you have this time thing of, you know, running out of time feeling under your eyes. So it's really up to you uh, whether you think it's uh, it's opportune for, for your way of planning, for your style um, to have a stopwatch or not. Please remember that it must be only a stopwatch. It cannot be a phone or anything like that because you're not supposed to use any electronics or anything uh, that can be used also to give you messages or things like that. So um, you will not be allowed to use your phone as a stopwatch uh, on the podium. Uh, so if you want to use one, just buy one of these cheap stopwatches that do only that. <laughs> The next question is, can we communicate with our team when the oralist is on the podium? No, and <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, you, you can, I mean, you can pass in, like those sitting in the front. So the other agent and the off council, they can exchange notes. Yes. Between and themselves. Even, between not themselves, to... not to the people sitting in the back, not with your coaches or whoever else is sitting there. And even there, my advice would be to do this as discreetly as possible. Silence is golden. You do not want to distract the judges from your co-agent's performance. And the same goes when the other team is, is arguing, be as quiet as possible. Try to not interrupt any, anybody, even with rattling papers or whatever like very practical piece of advice something that i learned by doing jessup and i still do it uh, in my professional life don't pass notes on paper use post-its they're much smaller and if your co-agent needs them as piece of information to bring to the podium they will stick on the whatever paper that they already have um the other thing is remember that and, and this is more related to the 
uh, let's say, style at the table, um, remember that judges will always look at you, even if you're not pleading, even if it's the turn of the other team. So please look, be engaged and look engaged throughout the round. Um, it looks very bad on you if you are just sitting there, like not really like having a posture or you're kind of not paying much attention. So usually judges appreciate when teams are very attentive, they're following the round, they're taking notes, and they do that in a very discreet way, not to disrupt whoever is talking. But just to go back to the very beginning of the question, when you are at the podium, you're alone. So no paper, nothing. And uh, one of our last questions, um, what is the best way to conclude an intervention? So in terms of asking uh, like um, how to conclude your answer to a question or a judge interrupting you, I would say, um, if you can manage to do it, do not conclude at all. You give the answer that you think is correct and sufficient, and then connect this to your pleading. If you get asked about a certain authority or a certain case, or if you get presented an argument of the other side, you will address the issue and then seamlessly take over to how this relates to your submission, how this relates to the current case, and then move along with your pleading, even though this might mean that you will skip one point or, or a smaller subsection of your arguments. But my advice would be that um, do not give a formal conclusion because, again, you want to have this idea of a very skilled conversation with the judges on very complicated matters. So it's not not ideal in my view to have a clear distinction between the prepared speech and the answers to questions. So combine them as seamlessly as possible. Um, great. So uh, I don't know if, if there's any last words you would like to give uh, the oralists before we conclude. Okay, maybe one piece of advice. Um, in terms of preparing and posture, again, there is not one single way of doing it. Um, what I've learned about myself is uh, as prepared as I can be when I'm very nervous, my hands are shaking. So in terms of hand gestures, um, I'm somebody who, who tends to stress his words uh, with gestures. Uh, but for a setting where I can be nervous, this might not be ideal. So um, in order to avoid the very obvious tells of shaky hands, it can be advisable to prepare sort of a more or less relaxed posture where you just put your hands on the podium. Don't grab it because then the entire podium might shake, but to just have them rest there and maybe think about, okay, if there is one thing that I want to stress, then incorporate gestures if it feels natural to you um, but try to uh, uh, not uh, uh, have anything in your hands uh, and uh, if they aren't needed for stressing arguments or for opening a folder just have them looking as relaxed as possible at the podium that would be my my final small clue <laughs> Well, then if we keep it to the very small things, um, avoid bringing anything to the podium which you can use to play when you're nervous. So don't bring a pen. Uh, I know some teams do started doing it because they think, oh, if judges ask many questions, I can write them down. You, you don't have time to write them down anyway. And in any case, most judges will ask you maybe two questions. And I would hope that you're all able to memorize two questions. So you don't need a pen because otherwise you will start doing like this or playing with it. Um, and the same goes with necklaces, uh, earrings, rings, anything that you may play with when you're stressed and maybe seem very superficial, but the same goes with hair. Either you're a girl or a boy is the same. If you have long hair, 
pull them back because otherwise you will start doing like this when you're nervous or playing and doing exactly. And this is not good because judges will start looking at you, but not for the, the judges will have to listen to orally speaking for 90 minutes in your round. In Washington DC, most judges do three, four, sometimes even five rounds in a day. So any little distraction will deviates the attention of the judges from what you're saying to what you're doing. And you don't want that. So you want the judges to think about your arguments and not about the fact that you, I don't know, play with your ring or you're unable to not touching your hair for more than one minute. So um, it, it could seem very silly, but in the end, you are going to be judged also for composure, style, pose, and all these kind of things. So please avoid that. Um, and for the rest, try to enjoy it. You will hear from the judges in DC that Jessup is about a conversation with the judges, which is absolutely true. Uh, we may seem mean when we ask questions, and you may uh, find us uh, very unpleasant. But you know, in the end, we are volunteers. Uh, we come to the Jessup because we like the Jessup. We like the atmosphere. We have friends in the dress up community, in the dress up family. So we are not there to uh, give you hard time just for the sake of it. Um, we know that you studied a lot, that you prepared, and we are there to test your knowledge. Um, but we are not there to torture you or to, you know, uh, let you have a very unpleasant experience. This is not what judges do. So um, keep that in mind. Talk to us uh, um, as if you're just having a nice conversation about international law with a person who's interested in the same things that you are interested in too. So I think you will hear this over and over again as a suggestion, as feedback at the end of your rounds. Uh, but I think in the end, this is key for a very successful performance. Well, thank you to our panelists. You're wonderful and you shared with us very valuable input, which I'm sure will help many, many students. Thank you everyone else for joining us. This panel concludes our training sessions for the Jessup season, but as the competition develops, stay tuned to our social media to see all the results. My personal recommendation for participants this year is to read the rules consciously, get to know as many people as you can and enjoy the ride. I wish you the best of luck for the 2023 Jessup competition. I hope to meet as you, I, I hope to meet as many of you here in DC for the international rounds. Have a great day or night wherever you are. Thank you. Bye. Bye.